Whitechapel Wednesdays, Part 2 Welcome to our new series of Whitechapel Wednesdays. In this weekly series, we cull together news reports in chronological order leading up to the infamous series of slayings. As Ripper enthusiasts will know, there is considerable discussion as to whether the slayings were confirmed only to the five reported, and we have included reports outside of the five to show the build-up of terror in the Whitechapel area. We have also included other, sometimes seemingly minor, news stories during this time to give you a picture of the life and times of Whitechapel of 1888 as events build to the series of slayings. In this series we offer no comment, but adhere strictly to the papers of the time, all in chronological order. Recap of last week. In last week's introductory episode, news reports covered victims Emma Elizabeth Smith, Ada Wilson and Annie Millwood, all living in Whitechapel in 1888. We also had the news report of the brutal killing of yet another as yet unknown victim found stabbed in 39 places. These four victims were dismissed at the time to being part of the Ripper murders. Historians and enthusiasts have looked at the possibility that three of the four victims of this time were practice runs of the Ripper. In this episode we look at the attempts of the police to find the identity of the woman stabbed and some of the initial suspects. From the Lloyd's Weekly newspaper, the 12th of August, 1888. Tragedy in Whitechapel. A woman stabbed in 39 places. At about 10 minutes to 5 o'clock on Tuesday morning, a man who lives at 47 George Yard Buildings, Whitechapel, was coming downstairs to go to work when he discovered the body of a woman lying in a pool of blood on the first floor landing. Reeves at once called in Constable Barrett, 26H, who was on his beat in the vicinity of George Yard, and Dr. Killeen of Brick Lane was communicated with and promptly arrived. He made an examination of the woman and pronounced life extinct giving his opinion that she had been brutally murdered, there being knife wounds in the breast, stomach and abdomen. There were 39 wounds in various parts of the body, which was that of a woman apparently between 35 and 40 years of age, about 5 foot 3 in height, dark complexion and dark hair, with a dark green skirt, a brown petticoat, a long black jacket and a black bonnet. The woman was not known to any of the occupants of the tenements on the landing on which the deceased was found, and no disturbance of any kind was heard during the night. The body was removed to Whitechapel mortuary. Mr George Collier opened an inquest on the body on Thursday at the Working Lads Institute, Whitechapel. She was stated to be Martha Turner, aged 38 a single woman lately living at 4 Star Place, Commercial Road, but previous to calling the first witness to the coroner said that the body had been identified that morning, but he had just been informed that two other persons also identified it as quite a different person, and under these circumstances he thought the question of identity had better be left to last. Elizabeth Mahoney of 47 George Yard Building, Whitechapel, the wife of a carman, stated that on the night of bank holiday she was out with some friends. She returned shortly before two in the morning with her husband and afterwards left the house to try and get some supper at the Chandler's shop. The stairs were then perfectly clear of any obstacle and were the same on her return. She and her husband heard no noise during the night, but at ten o'clock she was told that a murder had been committed in the building. There was no light on the staircase, and the spot where the body was found 
had been pointed out to her. She was sure it was not there at two o'clock as she went in, as it was in the wide part of the stairs and quite in the dark. Alfred George Crow, a cab driver of 35 George Yard Buildings, deposed that on Tuesday morning he returned home from work at half past three, and on his way up the stairs he saw somebody lying on the first landing. It was not an unusual thing to see, so he passed on and went to bed. He did not know whether the person was dead or alive when he passed. George Saunders Reeves, 37, George Yard Buildings, a waterside labourer, deposed that on Tuesday morning he left home at five o'clock to go in search of work. On the first floor landing he saw a female lying in a pool of blood. She lay on her back and seemed dead. He at once gave notice to the police. The woman was a perfect stranger to the witness. Her clothes were all disarranged, as if she had had a struggle with someone. The witness did not notice any instrument lying about. Police Constable Barrett, 226H, deposed to being called by the last witness to view the body of the deceased. She was lying on her back, and before she was moved, a doctor was sent for, and on arrival pronounced life extinct. The woman's hands were cleansed, but did not contain anything, and her clothes were disarranged. Dr. Timothy Robert Killeen, 28, Brick Lane, stated that he was called deceased and found her dead. He examined the body and found 39 puncture wounds. There were no less than nine in the throat and 17 in the breast. She appeared to have been dead for three hours. The body was well nourished. He had since made a post-mortem examination and found that the left lung penetrated in five places and the right lung in two places. The heart had been penetrated, but only in one place. Otherwise, it was quite healthy. The liver was healthy, but penetrated in five places and the spleen was penetrated in two places. The stomach was penetrated in six places and in the witness's opinion, the wounds were not afflicted with the same instrument, there being a deep wound in the breast from some long, strong instrument, whilst most of the others were done apparently with a penknife. The large wound could have been caused by a sword bayonet or dagger. It was impossible for the whole of the wounds to be self-inflicted. Death was due to the loss of blood consequent on the injuries. At the conclusion of this witness's evidence, the inquiry was adjourned. Two arrests at the Tower The case is in certain respects one of a very puzzling character. Owing to the fact that so many stab wounds were inflicted and there were no cries were heard. Although the poor woman was on some stone steps close to the doors of small rooms wherein several separate families resided, it now appears that on the night of bank holiday there were several soldiers in their neighbourhood, some of whom were seen drinking in the Princess Alice, two minutes' walk from George Yard Buildings, and the other taverns near. With these soldiers were the deceased and another woman, the later being known in the district as Mog and Pearly Paul. One of these men was a private, the other a corporal. It had been ascertained that only corporals and sergeants were allowed to wear sidearms while on leave. This fact, of course, narrows the issues as to the possibility of the identity of the assailant, presuming he was a soldier. Inquiries were at once set on foot by the police and military authorities, with the result that it stated two soldiers have been placed under military arrest at the Tower. The authorities 
declined to give their names unless some definite charge is formulated. The two soldiers are said to belong to the guards. A perplexing feature in connection with the outrage is the number of injuries on the young woman's body. That the stabs were from a weapon shaped like a bayonet is almost established beyond doubt. The wound over the heart was alone sufficient to kill, and death must have occurred as soon as that was inflicted. Unless the perpetrator was a madman or suffering to an unusual extent from drink delirium, no tangible explanation can be given of the reason for inflicting the other 38 injuries, some of which seem as if they were due to thrusts and cuts from a penknife. On the other hand, if the lesser wounds were given before the fatal injury, the cries of the deceased must have been heard by those who, at the time of the outrage, were sleeping within a few yards of the spot where the deed was committed. The difficulty of identification arose out of the brutal treatment to which the deceased was manifestly subjected, she being throttled whilst held down, and the face and head so swollen and distorted in consequence that her real features are not discernible. There is little doubt, although, she has been variously identified as a Mrs. Withers and a Mary Bryan, and she is a woman known as Martha Turner. Mrs. Bousfield, in whose house she lived till three weeks back, states that she had resided in her house for two months with Turner. The deceased had told her that her real name was either Staples or Stapleton, and that she had left her husband thirteen years and had taken up with Turner. Both she and this man got their living by selling trinkets in the streets, such as studs, links, chains and mental cones. She used to stand in Cheapside and various places while Turner occupied other ground. Turner left her some weeks ago and then the deceased who paid two shillings a week for her room got two weeks in arrears and as she could not pay she suddenly left. In addition to being identified as Mrs. Boosfield, the deceased had already been identified by one of the other two other women who saw her in the company of some soldiers at neighbouring public houses. There was a dispute and one of the soldiers struck the companion of the deceased a blow. This was just by George Yard, a long, dark thoroughfare, and it's believed that the deceased was forcibly dragged up to the place where she was found so brutally ill-treated and so fearfully wounded. The police had a description of the two soldiers who, as before stated, are believed to be in the guards. From the Westminster and Pimlico News, the 18th of August, 1888, Extraordinary Scenes at the Wellington Barracks. At noon on Wednesday, there was a parade of Coldstream and Grenadier Guards at the Wellington Barracks, Pimlico. It seems that soon after 11 o'clock, two police officers, Inspector Reed and Detective Sergeant Caunter, arrived with Mary Ann Connolly, otherwise Pearly Pole, and requested permission to make certain inquiries in regard to the murder of Martha Turner at Whitechapel on the night of bank holiday. The assembly call was at once sounded, and the men were drawn up in quarter column, after which they filed through a passage, where Inspector Reed, Sergeant Caunter, and another police officer were stationed with Pearly Paul. The woman was asked to scrutinise the faces of the soldiers as they passed for the purpose of seeing if she could pick out either of the men who were with her and the deceased on the night on which the murder was committed. After a small number had far passed, Pearly Paul picked out a man wearing stripes and taken by her to be a corporal, as the one who went away with the deceased woman. 
That's him, exclaimed she. I'm positive. The suspect was temporarily detained, and the filing by of others continued. When a, a few more had passed, the woman, scanning the features of everyone intently, pointed to a private as being the second man. She positively declared that he accompanied her to a house in the district where the murder took place. Are you positive? was asked, and Pearly Paul nodded and replied, certain. The military authorities immediately placed all the books showing the time at which the suspect men left and returned to the barracks on the night mentioned at the disposable of Inspector Reed and Sergeant Caunter. It was pointed out that the corporal was but a private with good conduct stripes, a man of exemplary character who was in the barracks by ten o'clock on bank holiday night. Other evidence as to his innocence, and also respecting the private's movements on the night of the crime, was also forthcoming. The former man was set at once exonerated, whilst the second, also a man of exceptionally good character, was formally told that further inquiries must be instituted. These inquiries were duly conducted, and he too was told that no stain rested upon him, as it was clearly a case of mistaken identity. It is asserted that as Pearly Paul had identified two innocent men who could not have been in Whitechapel at the time, she says, the police will not further seek her aid in elucidating the mystery. Neither of the men wore sidearms when they were left leaving the barracks on bank holiday and could not possibly have been in each other's company. The authorities say that they must now look elsewhere for a clue. This clue cannot, they asserted, be given by one of whom they at first considered the most reliable witness. From the Manchester Evening News, 18th of October, 1888, The Whitechapel Mystery. The officers engaged in elucidating the mystery of George Yard Buildings, wherein Martha Turner was, was discovered murdered, have it is believed, at last obtained a clue. Though it is feared it is not of a sufficient substantial nature to justify the belief that any immediate arrest will take place. Detective Inspector Reed, Inspector Leach, Detective Sergeant Caunter and other criminal investigation experts have visited every military depot in London. The names of those soldiers out on leave on the bank holiday night were given by the commanding officers and every assistance rendered to the police in questioning men upon whom the slightest suspicion might be supposed to rest. The authorities, having lost all faith in Pearly Paul's assistance, inasmuch as the two men whom she picked out at the Wellington barracks were proved to have been far away from the scene of the crime when it was committed. One of these soldiers quartered at Pimlico was certainly out all night on bank holiday, and that circumstance coupled with the fact of Pearly Pole's certainty as to his features at first placed him in a rather awkward position. However, he was able to prove that he was elsewhere, the truth of his story being placed beyond all doubt. No weapon with which the murder could have been perpetrated as yet been discovered, although the sewers in the vicinity of George Yard building have been searched, there has however been a clue discovered which may be of some service. A woman has, it is stated, come forward and asserted that at midnight a man took a bed in her house, which is situated in the neighbourhood, stating that he had lost his train for the country and could not return that night. He was dressed in the uniform of a soldier. The story had been inquired into by the police, but the result is not yet known. Some importance, however, is attached to the clue. A statement was made yesterday afternoon by Louisa Reeves, the wife of a dock labourer who first discovered the body when leaving for her day's work shortly before five o'clock in the morning. Mrs. Reeves explained that the screams of murder she'd heard earlier in the night 
must have proceeded from George Street and could not possibly have been heard by her if they had proceeded from the dying woman. Strange to say, during the night, Mr. and Mrs. Reeves woke up several times under an apprehension that something was going to happen. Not a scream was heard by them when they arised from their slumber. For Mr. Reeves went to his door and listened. I could not say, remarked Mrs. Reeves yesterday, but I knew something would happen out of the ordinary for me, and my own man were never so much disturbed before. Though we almost nightly hear cries of murder and police, we paid no attention to them whatever. But that night, Mrs. Reeves added, was a dreadful one. My husband thought of what I told him when he left for work, that I knew something was going to happen. For when he discovered the dead body, he was afraid to come and tell me, for fear I should go into a fit. We weren't awoken by screams, but there was a something we couldn't understand that seemed to tell us that trouble was at hand. That dreadful murder had disturbed us all here, and it will be some time before we quiet down and forget last bank holiday night. From the Southern Wales Echo, the 20th of August, 1888, Pearly Pole. Pearly Pole is a dangerous person to trust to. She bamboozled the police into the idea that she could give them a clue to the Whitechapel murder. It was done by a corporal and a private in the Grenadier Guards on bank holiday. Well, the soldiers were paraded, Pole picked out the men, but her corporal was a private with two good conduct stripes on his arm, a spotless character, an irrefragible alibi. The other man was shown to be equally innocent, so that the police must have been fooled all this time following up a false clue. It is always dangerous to trust for identification to the evidence of an ignorant, excitable woman of pearly Pole's class. In fact, her testimony at best is never a pearl of great price. From the Globe, the 24th of August, 1888. The Whitechapel murder resumed inquest verdict. Yesterday afternoon, Mr. George Collier, the deputy coroner for South East Middlesex, resumed the inquiry at the Working Lads Institute, Whitechapel, into the circumstances attending the death of a woman supposed to be Martha Turner, aged 35, a hawker, lately living at 4 Star Place, Star Street Commercial Road, who was discovered early on the morning of Tuesday the 7th uh, inst lying dead on the first floor landing of some model dwellings known as George Yard Buildings, Commercial Road, Spitalfields, her body being covered with 39 stab wounds. The murder was committed during bank holiday night and is almost identical with other murders which was perpetrated near the same spot on the night of the previous bank holiday. Henry Samuel Tabron of No. 6 River Terrace, East Greenwich, who was the first witness called, stated that he was a foreman packer in a furniture warehouse. He identified the body as that of his wife, 39 years of age. He last saw her alive 18 months ago in the Whitechapel Road. The witness had been separated from her for 13 years on account of her intemperate habits. He at first allowed her 12 shillings a week, but afterwards finding how she was living, he gave her only 2 shillings and sixpence a week. The witness identified the body through seeing an account of the murder in the people where her name was stated. Henry Turner, living at the working man's home, Cook Commercial Street, deposed that he was a carpenter by trade, but latterly he had got his living as a hawker. Up till three weeks previous to this affair, he was living with the deceased. They had lived together on and off for nine years. He last saw her alive on the Saturday before her death. 
when they met accidentally in Leadenhall Street. The deceased was a woman who, when she had the money, would get drunk with it, and was in the habit of staying out late at night. They lived comfortably till she took to drink. When he left her for a time, Mary Boosfield, Four Star Place, Commercial Road, deposed that Turner and the deceased lived at her house till three weeks before her death. She was a woman who would rather have a glass of ale than a cup of tea, but she did not get drunk. The deceased was greatly in the witness's debt and left without giving notice. After that, the deceased returned and forced the window and occupied the room one night without the witness knowing she was there. Mary Ann Connolly, known as Pearly Poll, was next examined. But before giving evidence, Inspector Reed asked that she might be cautioned previous to being sworn. This the coroner did, and the witness then said she had been living at a lodging house in Dorset Street. She had known the deceased for four or five months under the name of Emma. The last time she saw her live was on Bank Holiday, when they went to a public house together and were accompanied by two soldiers, one a private and the other a corporal. She didn't know regiment they belonged, but they had a white band around their caps. The witnesses did not know if the corporal had any sidearms on, and they drank with the soldiers in several public houses. Then they separated, the deceased walking away with the private up George Yard. Before they parted, the witness and the corporal had a quarrel, and he hit her with a stick. She did not see the deceased quarrelling. The witness had tried to identify two men, and at Wellington Barracks, where the men were paraded before her, she picked out two whom she thought were with her and the deceased on the night of the murder. Inspector Reed, did you threaten to drown yourself since the occurrence? The witness, yes, but only in a lark. Inspector Reed said that the witness had kept out of the way purposely, and it was only by searching that they found her. Many persons had come forward and made statements, but up to the present, the police had been unable to secure the guilty party or parties. The coroner, in summing up, said that the crime was one of the most brutal that had occurred for some years. The police would endeavour to bring home the crime to the guilty parties. He sincerely hoped that they would be captured and brought to justice. The jury after a short deliberation, returned a verdict of willful murder against some person or persons unknown. This concludes this episode of Whitechapel Wednesdays. We really hope you enjoyed the show. The next set of relevant chronological news reports will be uploaded next Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We're aiming for 1,000 subscribers. There's no cost to you, and it really helps us to support us. Just tap on the subscribe button that pops up if you have not already subscribed. We have listened to our listeners' feedback and are working on increasing our longer episodes to four times a week. They will be uploaded on Tuesdays, Wednesdays for our Whitechapel Wednesdays, Thursdays and our new serial killer Saturdays with shorter but we still believe interesting stories being uploaded on the other days of the week. For our podcast listeners you can still see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News at the Times, and I am Robin Coles.